everyone. I'm Wendy Hisko, the director here, and we're here um, to have Professor Tracy Griffith, who's from St. Michael's College. She's the chair and um, of the Media Studies, Journalism, and Digital Arts Department, and she's here to hopefully have a great talk. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so welcome. <coughs> so, welcome. Good evening. So I'm going to start off our conversation about free speech versus hate speech. And keeping in mind that I am a teacher, right? So we're going to start off a little quiz, right? OK. So um, the handout that I, that I gave you talks about the differences between free speech and hate speech. Um, what are the um, <clears throat> criteria? What does the First Amendment protect? And um, we'll get a little bit deeper into it as we go along. And I am totally open for questions or comments. Um, we're very informal, OK? All right, first question on our quiz. When is it to talk about candidates being killed? OK? So conservative political commentator tells, his, tells interviewers, if I'm going to say anything about John Edwards in the future, I'll just wish he had been killed in a terrorist assassination plot. Conversely, a North Carolina accountant threatens uh, then President, um, oh sorry, then Senator Barack Obama um, at a Waffle House in North Carolina. And he says, Obama and his wife are never going to make it to the White House. He needs to be taken out, and I can do it in a heartbeat. What do you think about those statements? Are they permissible? Are they acceptable? Let's take a look. If you had to pick one, which one would you say is acceptable? The first one? OK. You're right. OK. In the second instance, he was convicted of making repeated threats against then-candidate Obama. But Ann Coulter, who made the first statement, was not arrested, right? It was perfectly fine in the context of political commentary, protected under the First Amendment. Let's move on to the next one. OK. Police response. Church members show up to a soldier's funeral carrying picket signs that say, thank God for dead soldiers. God hates America. Police permit their protest in a public space 1,000 feet away from the funeral. On the other side, a group of teens decides to burn a cross on the lawn of one of the teen's black neighbors. Police arrest and charge them with violating a local ordinance outlawing the display of symbols that arouse anger on the basis of race. Which one is acceptable? From a legal perspective, under the First Amendment. First one. Anybody know what this one's talking about? Westboro Baptist Church. Yes, absolutely. Right? Westboro Baptist Church, as much as we might not like what they say, they have the First Amendment right to say it. Right? That's one of the protected rights under the First Amendment to protest. Other cases. In the second one, this was, happened in Oklahoma. And in that case, um, was it Oklahoma? Minneapolis, Minneapolis, sorry. Um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the court said, uh, no, you, you can't specifically target individuals for that kind of hate speech. OK, let's move on. Uh, sorry. Public university allow, allows an alt-right speaker onto campus. Among the things that this alt-right speaker believes, this country belongs to white people. Um, later on, after allowing and inviting him to come, uh, they say that he poses a security risk. Um, and they rescind 
their invitation. On the other side, again, public university, um, openly chides a public a law professor, a law professor, all right, who has a party at her house, her private house. Students, faculty, she shows up, greets them in blackface, right, and she says she used this as a means of explaining um, the racial disparities in America. Which one permissible? Can the public university ban the speaker? Prevent the speaker from coming? Or can this particular professor, in the privacy of her own home, perform blackface? It's a question of whether or not she's going to be in some way sanctioned for blackface. Are there people that think she should have that class? Yes. And the party was put on a private party or a party for her students? It was students. Students and other faculty were in attendance. Yeah, that's the one of the parties. Incorrectly. Okay, so we're going. First one is allowed. Okay. Click on the one on the right. <laughs> okay. So the university rescinds this person's invitation to speak. Right? It will. Go ahead. Is that what we're saying? No. What we're saying is, say that again? CNN? Yeah. And this was, this was, as I say, it was at Auburn, right? And they did not allow Richard Spencer to come because they say that he would have caused a security risk at the public university. Maybe. You could you could use them interchangeably almost. I don't like it, but I can kind of go along with it if it's if you're dealing with a safety issue. But like somebody else said, they shouldn't have invited him if they didn't have the security in place. Okay, let's move on to the next one. I'm just using these to give us some background, some basis, right? Because these are real world situations that have been happening over the last couple of years, dealing with free speech and hate speech. Yes? Security. It could certainly be perceived that way. And that is, of course, the way that Richard Spencer perceived it, right, as a form of censorship. Don't like that. Okay, that's a great question, right? Is censorship ever okay for the general good? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about ways in which the government can legally censor, right? So the approach with Richard Spencer, the safety and security issue is one area in which the government has the ability to, it's not necessarily aimed at censoring, right? But it's a balancing act. You're balancing, right, the right to people to be safe with 
free speech rights of Richard Spencer. And in that circumstance, the court, and the courts have said that these different things need to be taken into consideration, and you can, right, censor if there's, if there's a question of safety and security. It can happen. Let's look at the next one. Internet radio host, right? He's upset about Chicago's ban on handguns. And he says that the judges who made the determination about the bans on handguns need to be killed. And he posts online the judges' photographs and a map of the building where they work. Okay? We've seen similar kinds of, of um, similar kinds of situations with this with abortion doctors, right? With their pictures and at home addresses being listed. Yeah. Um, on the other side, a music video rapper appears alongside the president, right? Um, and he basically represents the president dressed as a clown. He points a revolver at the, um, at the president and pulls a trigger. Flag pops out. Bang. So what we're representing here, or what the rapper, Ronald Klump, the clown rapper, is representing. Do we have problems with either one of these two? Which one of these is most problematic? The one on the left. Okay? Okay? There we go. Absolutely. I think that one was a little easier. Okay? Okay. We're looking at what constitutes what's protected under the First Amendment. Okay, keep that in mind. We've got a survivor of child sex abuse, and she writes about incest and child molestation and rape. Okay. Um, also talks about torturing and murdering kids. On the other side, we've got a pornographic magazine. They publish a fake ad featuring a famous televangelist. And the televangelist is talking about, the, supposedly talking about, um, the first time that he had sex with his mother. The latter, this, this second one, actually became a legal case. Does anybody, Jerry Falwell and Hustler? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, really? OK. No. <laughs> right? That's true. Yeah. That's true. But in this one, she's not saying that she committed the crime. She's the victim of the crime. Oh. Right? But you'll find that as, as, as we go through, that the First Amendment very clearly excludes any kind of child pornography. Whether it's a depiction, description, <coughs> it does not protect child pornography, right? So there's no First Amendment for that. No First Amendment protection for that. I think this one's our last one. Um, which speech is protected? speech is protected, which do you think? The guy describing um, a Sandy Hook-like um, mass shooting, or the guy that talks about the benefits of pedophilia? Which one do you think is protected? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One on the right? Which one is protected? Which is protected speech under the First Amendment? We've got one guy talking about pedophilia, and we've got one other guy talking about killing kids. Okay, you think he's protected? <laughs> yes, and the interesting thing is, um, this this was this speech was made by Milo Yiannopoulos. Sound familiar to anybody? Um, yeah, he talking about the crime is not necessarily crime and yeah whereas the other guy was actually charged for issuing threats specific threats okay so in the first one it's because he was talking about his own victimization she mm -hmm. she okay mm -hmm. with specifics about what happened. Depicting or describing sexual conduct in a patently offensive way is obscenity and it's not protected by the First Amendment. Whereas he just simply praised pedophilia. This guy, Yiannopoulos, just simply praised pedophilia. The one before was specifically talking about specifics of the act of pedophilia. It, exactly. He didn't depict or describe it in any way. He just said it was great. Okay. So if he had gone into specifics, he, then it would not have been protected? It probably would not, it would not have been protected. Depicting or describing sexual conduct with children is kitty porn, and that's not protected by the First Amendment. Apparently not. Okay, let's look at let's look at how hate speech has basically come about. And we'll look at some of these some of the examples that we met in the quiz are some of the guys that we're going to talk about here, right? Um, so three basic three basic people that I'm going to kind of focus on tonight in terms of looking at what qualifies as hate speech: Milo Yiannopoulos, Richard Spencer and Charles Murray, okay? Um, first off, and I put this on the handout as well, this is our First Amendment, right? The First Amendment, we won't, we're not talking about the religion clause tonight, we're talking specifically about the First Amendment, the aspect of the First Amendment that deals with free speech issues, okay? So Congress, meaning government, you know, in order for protection of the First Amendment, the First Amendment protects citizens against government infringing on, and here's the list, right, um, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to peaceably assemble, right, and to petition the government. The First Amendment protects citizens against or against the government. The government cannot infringe on these, on these aspects of free speech, right, and obviously over time, Free speech has not just meant words that are coming out of your mouth. Free press has not just meant written word, right? It's been interpreted throughout case law to include the technology that currently exists, right? So the government can't infringe on your free speech rights even if it's over the internet or even if it's, you know, standing out, you know, based on the technology that currently exists, right? Government cannot infringe on those rights, okay? So Let's understand what we're working with here in terms of any private entity has the ability to infringe on your free speech rights. 
because they don't grant you free speech rights, right? The rights and the responsibilities are defined within the Constitution. This aspect of the Constitution gives to the American citizens rights conferred upon you by the government. The government gives you these rights, and they cannot infringe upon them. Yes? So if I say something that's told in public place, the government cannot do anything to me, depending on what I say. Yes. My employer could fire me. Absolutely. And one of the prime examples of that, I don't know if you had followed or seen the guy who was fired from UNO's yeah. after he participated in Charlottesville. Right, UNO's is a private business. They can decide who works there and who doesn't. Okay, so, but if he had worked for the library, right, the library would have had a hard time firing him for participating at Charlottesville because it's a public entity, and he has the right, unless they could somehow show that he wasn't peacefully assembling, maybe he was the one throwing rocks. Um, <clears throat> but if, right, they, the library would have a hard time sanctioning him in any way because they are a public, they are part of the government. Yes? If the privately entity fired you, yes. No, because <clears throat> when you work for a private company, they, you don't have a right to work for that company. Uh, right? Yeah. So uh, they, that should be uh, told before, the, before you get hired. Mm -hmm. I mean, that uh, the company has some rule you can say something uh, or some kind of thing. But if you I'm, sure, I'm, sh I'm yeah. sure they must. But if there is you are I'm not a labor lawyer. <laughs> Let me just say that. <laughs> um, but I'm sure that I'm sure that he could he might have some kind of redress if he was dealing with a company that had fired him for no cause. But then again, maybe he just works at will. I don't know. It depends on the com depends on the company, depends on the contract, depends on a whole lot of other yes. Thanks for asking. Okay, so you know, you'll notice that it says Congress, right? So when the First Amendment um, was first put into place, it meant federal government, right? And through a case called Gitlaw, G-I-T-L-O-W, Gitlaw, the Gitlaw case made the First Amendment, linked the First Amendment to the states through the 14th Amendment, which is the equal protection, right? And basically made it so that now, post Gitlaw, the First Amendment also applies to, to state government. So it applies to all levels of government. But it was a, it, that only came about after it was interpreted that way through the Gitlaw case. Other questions? Okay, so we know what we're working with. We know what, we know what the First Amendment protects. Okay. Let's look at hate speech, right? So if First Amendment, if the First Amendment protects speech, your right to speech in whatever form and using whatever medium, right? Hate speech is speech that is specifically intended, right, to, I, I, won't, I shouldn't say cause harm, but it is an expression of hatred, right? It's an expression that's aimed at communicating some, distaste for something, or someone usually, right? And that somewhat, that distaste for that person is usually based on some protected category, race, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, disability, etc. okay? So this is what we're working with in terms of hate speech. And we recognize that there's so many different things that could fall under the definition of hate speech, right? The courts have basically said um, viewpoint discrimination, meaning racially offensive viewpoints, prohibiting that is unconstitutional. Because why we're, the reason that we're we would be prohibiting it, or the government would be prohibiting it, 
is because of what it represents. And that is not allowed. In other words, the government should not have the ability to restrict speech because they don't like it. And somehow, that makes sense to us. We're like, of course, we don't want our government to restrict our speech because they don't like what we're saying, right? I mean, you, if you look you know, way back when, they had sedition laws aimed at the, the government didn't want you speaking out against the government, and so they would punish you for doing that. We obviously don't want that. We want to have the ability to speak out against our government. We, we want the ability to speak out and we don't want the government to be able to restrict that speech because they don't like what we're saying. But then that means that sometimes we don't like what other people are saying, right? And you can't have it both ways. You can't have it where our speech is acceptable but their speech is not, okay? That's, it's considered viewpoint discrimination and we wouldn't want that either. But then of course that opens up a whole can of worms. So if you remember what happened at Middlebury last year, right? Charles Murray came to campus um, and it resulted in a huge firestorm. Um, one of the professors um, got a concussion. Um, there were fire alarms that were set off. There was huge outcry, massive protests. Um, all happening right down the street from us, right? Because they did not, the students did not want Murray to come and speak. Um, now Murray is, Murray is the author of The Bell Curve, major premise of his book, although he was not there to speak about that book, he had written a new book that he was there to talk about. Um, but the major premise of the book that made him famous, right, is that, um, that black people are inferior, that all other races, but black people in particular, are inferior to the white race. And he has scientific proof of that. That was the basis of the bell curve, okay? Um, and when he showed up at Middlebury, there was a huge outcry. Um, then we've got Richard Spencer. Last year, he went to Florida, uh, University of Florida, to speak. Right, um, and this was his quote, right? They came out again in protest of him. His, you know, his comment, you want to stop me, but you're going to fail. Richard Spencer um, is widely held as the leader of the alt-right. Um, uh, a, a more modern version of white supremacists. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's Richard Spencer. Um, the image on the right is Charles Murray at Middlebury. The image on the left is um, from Spencer at um, at University of Florida. And uh, the Middlebury professor who was hurt, right, her major point was when violence erupts from distasteful speech, nobody wins. Nobody wins, right? Because then the story becomes about the violence and nobody's viewpoint is heard. In Brandenburg versus Ohio, Supreme Court case, um, <clears throat> the Supreme Court basically said, you know what, inflammatory speech, speech, hate speech, that, that creates such a ruckus, right, that it causes people to go out and commit illegal acts. That is the kind of speech we want to prohibit. But short of speech that is so inflammatory that it causes someone or it causes people to lash out to do these illegal activities, short of that, 
it's perfectly permissible. So basically the standard, and it's often referred to as an incitement to riot. If the speech is aimed at getting people to go out and commit an illegal act, whether that be burning crosses, burning down people's houses, you know, starting a riot, whether the, whatever the action is that is illegal, if the speech is intended to rile people up to do those things that are targeted hatefully towards those protected groups, that is speech we don't want to happen. And under Brandenburg, the courts have said that's the kind of speech that, we can, that the government can legally restrict. Yes? Well, the courts, under Brandenburg, the courts are going to look at, there are four elements. The courts are going to look at, is, is it likely to happen? Is somebody going to take that speech, and, it, and they, are they going to use that to compel them to go out and do it? Is it likely? The courts are also going to look at, is it imminent? Is it likely to happen soon? Now, they haven't, def they haven't, deci they haven't defined soon, right? They haven't defined soon. But there's a question of, is it imminent? In other words, is it something that somebody is reading today, and they're thinking about, and they're plotting and planning, and maybe in a year, they're going to carry out this, right? That would not be speech. We would not, pro the government would not prohibit that kind of speech, okay? So we need it to be likely. We need it to be imminent. We need it to be unlawful. There needs to be some form of unlawful action. It sounds like it's only decided that it doesn't have to be a free speech after the fact. Mm -hmm. Kind of tricky, isn't it? Shot, that was hate speech. If they don't end up shot, they're okay. Well, well you know, they, they would also look at, you know, the people who are in the audience, as an example, right? Do they have the means to carry out the action now, the imminent action now? Are they are they likely to be compelled to do it, to go out and do it now? And they're also looking at the intent of the person's speech. Is the intent behind the person's speech to compel people to go out and do these unlawful things? Oh, yes, welcome to. Yes. You don't know someone may be very crazy to do this kind of thing. And that may have been very strong. Okay, but do we want our government because to restrict speech based on crazy? No. I mean, he is crazy. Crazy. That, that guy, that guy, is the, the way to give the direction and the map, the, the point, that's very easy. Right, and, and I will say that a lot, a lot of these First Amendment cases were decided prior to the technology that we currently have, yeah. right? Um, you know, there are, a number of, there are a number of cases that are newer, that are coming up, that are working their way up. They may not get to the Supreme Court. I don't know if you, if you all have been following the case with um, the young girl who was, she's been convicted, right, of prompting her boyfriend, boyfriend to commit suicide, mm -hmm. right? Um, and she was convicted, but I think there's, there's an appeal in there somewhere, right? I know it goes back to that, is it likely? Is it imminent? Was it her intent to actually have him to commit suicide? Yeah. Could you, could you help us distinguish speech like you should go do this as, as in like you should do this illegal act or whatever mm -hmm. versus simply casting condemnation on a on a group and 
recommend someone going and do a, doing a crime based on that, uh, even if we could say it's based on that aspersion that they cast on you. The diff in, the, in the light of Brady, Brady Bill. Sure, the difference is intent. The difference is intent, right? If, if you say, oh, I hate these people, they really should, somebody should, they should just die. I wish they would just die, right? As opposed to, you really should take the weapons you have and go out and kill these people. There's a difference of intent. Unfortunately, I think you're right, right? The intent is kind of shown once the action happens. But on the flip side of it, right, sometimes, sometimes the government actor reads into it and they can say, you know what, um, Richard Spencer probably should not show up at the Brownell Library. We just don't have the capacity. And so we cannot have you come here to speak. We don't have the capacity for the circus that's going to ensue when you show up. We don't have the security. We don't it will be a dangerous situation. And in those kinds of, they're projecting, right? Um, but, you know, maybe they're not projecting. Maybe they can look at what happened at, in other places and say, bad news follows you, guy. Like, we can't have it here. Mm -hmm. Correct. But if something happens and uh, the criminal thing happened uh, uh, and the proof, there is proof that uh, that guy used the way he presents uh, an internet or the movie uh, or, mm -hmm. or the screen or anything, then can you stop the criminal charge, this one? I mean, the person who commits the crime? The speaker. Yeah. Speaker could maybe a kind of responsibility to for that bad crime. Well, no. I mean, no. The speaker the speaker is responsible for the speech, not for the act. So if someone else goes out and commits the act. But I think he helped, he helped the, the guy do this kind of crime. Well, see, but that's, OK, so that's that's part, of the, that's part of the issue with this case with this young woman and the kid who committed suicide, right? Because they're saying that based on her speech, he went out and committed this illegal act, which is suicide, right? He committed, he, he performed the act because of her speech. And so they're charging her, right, as being complicit in his action. I don't know, how do you feel about that? Do you think that the speaker should be responsible for the actions? You said crazy. You know, do you think that the speaker should be responsible for the actions of, the, of people who go out and commit the acts based on what they say? A bartender is charged with not serving a customer who is obviously drunk. Correct? OK. Because, and if he were to serve that customer, the customer would then should drive and kill someone. The bar would be partially liable, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the argument is that, you know, addresses are, are public information. It's not as if all he did was, all this person did in terms of assembling and aggregate the information in one location. I mean, if you really wanted to know where anybody lives, it's public information, for the most part. Right? Mm -hmm. Are there certain keywords that they look for? Like, used to be like the word revolution. You had to be very careful about how you use that in speech. Mm. As one, um, but this law had been in effect in 1968 during the Chicago Democratic National Convention when the Chicago 7 spoke. 
Mm -hmm. They had the riots, and a lot of this, these people were talking about revolution in the streets and things like that. In your opinion, do you think they could have stopped that speech? Could they have stopped it? They could have stopped it. I mean, if you, if you advocate the violent overthrow of the US government, right? Is that peaceful assembly or? Yes, they're different. They're different. Yes. You know, the last year, Ann Coulter went out to Berkeley to give a speech. Mm -hmm. it was supposed to be the birthplace of free speech. Yes. And the rowdy students drove her off the stage. They shut her down, didn't they? Is that not your time of free speech? I would say that it would be. Mm -hmm. That would never happen on stage. Oh, I'm sure. Absolutely. So how's it not, how are they just not both exercising their rights? Yeah, but my right to speak, my right to speak doesn't include shutting down your right to speak. Or does it? No, it does not. No, that's what I thought. So. Right, so it, it's that balancing act again. And I'm sure that the students who were involved in that had some kind of repercussion for it. I'm sure they did. Just like the students at Middlebury. There are repercussions. There were, yeah. Um, so, so yes. Why would they be repercussions if they're so good at the model that they go to Berkeley and they just go to that speech? Right. I don't, the, the Ann Coulter, the Ann Coulter situation, did they, I think that they stormed the place where she was supposedly speaking. I think. I think that's why you stopped last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, if they had just, if they had just, I don't know, if they had just stood outside with bullhorns and just screamed loud enough so that she couldn't be heard, they might have been fine. Yeah. They might have been fine. Um, we're seeing more and more and more of this, right? And it's happening a lot on college campuses, which, right, that's supposed to be the place where free speech and ideas are, you know, but, right? The, um, the University of Florida event, uh, where Spencer spoke. Um, Yiannopoulos has been on a tour um, to many institutions around the country. Um, and he's been met with a lot of resistance. But this is him, right? It's kind of his shtick. Right? His idea is to create as much mayhem as possible and get as much coverage as possible, and it elevates his position. That's, that's him. So this is um, just an example of what happened when he appeared at DePaul University, my alma mater, my undergrad alma mater. Um, So <laughs> the interesting thing, no, notice the name of his tour, right? And the reason you can't see them is because they're It'll pop up again. <laughs> Nothing happened. Over here? Yeah. I mean, um, he is an interesting guy. I, I don't know how else to really say that. Um, this, he was eventually, he eventually left because this was the beginning of about an hour and 40 minutes <laughs> um, where more people just kind of rushed the stage and just sat on the front of the stage and would not allow him to proceed. He just couldn't, 
it was just too much mayhem, right? Um, and at one point, they, you know, they called security, and security came, but security didn't, you know. And keeping in mind, DePaul is a Catholic institution, right? They could just as easily have removed the, you know, the students who were interrupting him and allowed him to continue. Um, but eventually, he ended up getting up. He ended up leaving because they were so disruptive. Now, I'm not sure that having that kind of reaction is a really positive thing, right? Is that speech denied again? Say that again? Is that speech denied, even if it's offensive and it's something you don't want to hear? Absolutely it is. But Absolutely it is. But the back, the, I mean, that, the black student, he's mm -hmm. a kind of speech, right? <laughs> he's well, just, I just, he, uh, the thing is, when, when two competing interests collide, who yeah. wins? Nobody. Nobody. Yeah, why? Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> Go ahead. I think if you don't compete on that, it sometimes, I think, it's a very, it may be the difficult. It, I don't think, I'm not sure it's the right thing to do that, like that student. But right. The, if you don't do anything, just let him say. You, you need to express something if you do that. So, so let other people know, I think, other ideas. Yeah. There, I mean, there is that, there is that theory. There is that theory. But if you, the idea behind it, right, that in order to protect free speech, you have to allow, allow free speech. Right? You can't pick and choose. Otherwise, it's really not free speech at all. Right? So how can they not give him a debate forum instead of just one speaking and the other not allowing to speak? Put it more in a debate format. Well, there, I mean, there are a number of reasons or a number of thoughts behind that, right? So um, some say that by even allowing that kind of you know, free speech forum to happen lends legitimacy to the hateful speech, as if there as if there's something to be debated, right? And that was the big argument with um, with Charles Murray, right? You're inviting someone to the institution, someone who believes in my innate inferiority, and you expect me to have a conversation. Right, we're not starting from the same place. Right, so in terms of the free speech aspect, it totally it makes sense that 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 maybe that type of forum makes sense. But the argument on the on the on one side is by even inviting him, you're lending legitimacy to claims that are absurd. Right, that if if the debate was. Would you invite someone to speak in your institution of higher learning, someone who says that the earth is flat? No, because that's already been a, that's been a debated and resolved issue. If you bring someone who espouses those kinds of ideas, it's as if we have something to be discussed, which can be prob which seems to be hateful in itself. You know, so I, yeah, I don't know. So what's the alternative? Right? Yes? It seems like these universities all over the country are really irresponsible when they invite people that are prone to excite civil disobedience. So don't they have some responsibility? Well, I Free speech is one thing, but free speech and responsibility is but a lot of it is not the university it's not. themselves, it's the, you know, a club. Well, I'm talking about university. when it is the university. It's it's you, it's, it's, well, it's usually not the university. And I'll tell you, um, like the Yiannopoulos, the places where Yiannopoulos has gone, um, and where Richard Spencer has gone, usually it's um, some form of the student conservative club that is, um, that is sponsored by a larger outside institution. And the larger outside organization provides them money, the college club, money to bring the speakers. 
And so the college club will sponsor the speaker, and the speaker will come. Do they have to make those facilities available when that kind of money is coming? The, the, pub, no. the public university? Yes. OK, and what grounds will they, will they say, no, he can't come? That might be it, but if, if you're the institution, when you say no to Richard Spencer, right, you've now given him the platform to say, look, they, they are censoring my ideas. They don't want me to speak at their institution. And when you say yes, you are inadvertently legitimized what he's going to say. Exactly. Catch 22. No <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a very, it's a very difficult, it's a difficult dilemma, right? It's, it's a very difficult situation because the institution is put in a position of do we, do we squash this person's free speech rights, but then that gives them kind of more ammunition, right, to say, look, they are trying, he said it, right? Spencer said it in one of the previous ones, right? He, he basically said, you are trying to silence me because you think I'm right, right? You want, me, you want to shut me down because you think that I'm right. And yes, right? You want to suppress my free speech. You know that I'm, what I'm saying is true. You don't want me to say it. Mm, that works really well to a certain crowd, right, in terms of drumming up more support. So the institution is in a position of, OK, if we, if we do not allow him to come, we're kind of giving him ammunition right, to be heard louder. And if we allow him to come, exactly, we're giving him the platform to espouse these views. But legally, he has a right to free speech. Places that public universities, facilities they have available for speeches sponsored by their little student groups. Yes. Um, what if they just said we're not doing that anymore for anyone, and we're just going to we're just going to have you know school sponsored speakers like we normally do? And to my knowledge, they're allowed to, of course, you know they can hire which teachers they want to have whatever views they want to yeah. produce the curriculum that they want. Would that solve the problem? Would it really though? Because then we're, then what we're doing is we are. We're reducing, we're censoring, we're, we're making it, the idea, the college is that place where you are exposed to things that you wouldn't normally be exposed. That's the place where you go to learn. And if you're not allowed to be exposed to things that you know, the administration might feel is, are not appropriate to, for you, or you, you're never, where does, it, where does it stop? Should we then not, teach, you know, biology. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, where do, where do if, if we, if, if the institution, particularly public institutions, are able to say, we don't want that in our institution. So you're saying they, have, they are constitutionally required to make these spaces publicly available for these types of speakers? They can't censor. They can't censor based on what, based on the fact that they don't like the speaker. Right. There has to be a reason, and it's usually safety. Yeah. It's usually some oh, safety yeah. security. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, but just to say we won't allow this person to come because we don't like them. Okay. That's censorship. I get that very quickly. Yeah. Yes. As I look at this, it seems like it's not so much a speech, it's the arena. The arena becomes explosive. And the university ought to have some way to be able to control the arena if they want to do this um, through broadcasting. He's going to give a speech. He's going to be here. But there will be no seats available. You can watch it on a local PBS station or streaming on your phone. Are the students looking more for an event than a speech? Right. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, they tried that with Charles Murray. After they removed him from they removed him from the auditorium, they took him to a room and then they were doing it on a screen. And 
that didn't work out either. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But part of the issue, I realize that that's the speaker, and the right. speaker is saying something that may or may not be exciting people. But the speaker isn't speaking to a room with only people in it who think he's wrong. No, more that likely than not. There, there are a bunch of like-minded right. people attending. If, well, you if, saw the if, people right, in the audience. If there was just one person <laughs> saying all this, I mean, I realize I'm not talking about not protecting that person. I'm just pointing out that that, that person who's saying these things that, that we may feel are awful is speaking to a bunch of people who agree with them. You like, are so absolutely can, right. Like president, uh, <laughs> yes, right. I mean, if you, if, right, if you saw um, a lot of the footage from the presidential campaign, right, um, a lot of the things that happened at President Trump's um, campaign stops were in, there were plenty of people who agreed, and then the poor like three individuals who like spoke out, well, we saw what happened to their free speech rights, right? It, 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 it's, I, I, understand, I agree with you. I, I, I don't personally think that the problem is with these speakers. I think it's much more with the people that we go to church with and we, you know, go to school, you know, who's on the PTO with us, or it's much more about the people who are all about these guys than it is about the, the individual guys that are doing the speaking. But, yeah. When, uh, when one group on campus invites a speaker to come before the person ever gets there, the other part of the campus is up in arms about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so true, so true. Um, so the ACLU, um, you know, obviously deals a lot with free speech and hate speech issues, um, you know, and they're, they're, what was that? Uh oh, okay, all right. Um, so, you know, their, their thought process behind it is that we can't, we can't rid the world of speech we just don't agree with. Right? We, have to, we have to figure out a way to allow the speech, regardless of what we may feel about it, right? we have to find a way to allow that speech to exist and then to allow people to make their own minds up about that speech. Right? Because pushing hate speech underground doesn't do anything the hate speech, the hatred still exists, right? It's just you don't know when it's coming or who it's coming from. It seems as if we want that speech to be out and available to the public so the public has an ability to kind of reconcile it in their own mind and come to their own decisions about the hatefulness or not hatefulness of it, right? Um, Lastly, most Americans oppose hate speech laws. This was taken just la this survey was taken just last year, right? Um, and they, fifty nine percent, people should be allowed to express those ideas, regardless of how hateful they might be regardless of how offensive they might be, it's important that they are allowed to express them because that is what is at the core of the First Amendment. But it's also a question of phrasing of your actual two different questions. You think? Yeah, exactly. Do you think... Say that again? Oh, you can't read the blue one. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that the government should, should prohibit people from engaging in hate speech? Uh, I think they should be able to limit hate speech. Uh, but here it talks about unpopular opinions mm -hmm. or. Which is different. Yeah, which is speech. offensive, is different than hate. Hate crosses a line. Mm -hmm. What's that line? 
that uh, you have been trying to describe to us over the last yes. 30 minutes. <laughs> um, it involves intent for harm, it involves some sort of urgency. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it's insightful. Yes. And that crosses the line. So if the questions were more narrowly asked, maybe this ratio of opinion would be different. Who conducted the poll? The Cato Institute. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. Let's take our own poll. Should the government, let me make sure I get it right, should the government prevent people from engaging in hate speech against certain groups? Which groups? Certain groups. Certain groups. The government. And how would they prevent there's limits? Can we have limits? As one of our options. How do we feel about limits? I think last thing is limits. Somebody, somebody, limit. so somebody so clearly has to make the decision. So if you yeah. want to hate this group, you get to. You get to say I hate these people. Mm -hmm. But if you want to say, you know what we should do? We should kill this group. That's not. That's a limit. That's not. So, is kill the line? Harm. Well, but if they just, if you're just saying I hate the people, then it's not hate speech. It's not hate speech. It's hate speech when you say I hate the people, you should kill them. Here's the map. Here's the map. Here's the gun. And the time. So is hate speech with a threat attached? Is that the line? Does the threat need to be the threat of losing Imminent harm? I don't know. Can we, can we just burn down their houses? No. No. But, but I'm asking that because people are saying kill. So I'm saying, can it be less than kill and still be wrong? Yeah. I think. Harm. Physical harm. Physical harm? Financially, you can't get a job anywhere. So but, but. Well, emotional harm because then any hate speech would be. You could say that creates emotional harm. We're seeing the difficulty here, right? Yes, very difficult. Yeah, it's it is. It's going to be easy. It is. And I'm right. also worried about the groups. No, this is real, because who's going to decide what groups? Yeah. Well, uh, the government has already decided what groups. The groups are based on race. The groups are based on gender. The groups are based on disability. The groups are based on national origin. We have, we have the protected classes of people. OK, well, so for example, where does transgender fall? Gender. Because I've heard it doesn't, that it's, it's not covered. It's well, until we get a, until we get a good legal case that includes it, it's not really it's not really covered. It's not it's not specifically covered, not by the federal. I don't I don't think the government got the more control is a better idea. <laughs> I do. I okay. From, I come from China, <laughs> so that, that's the problem. <laughs> So we don't want too much government control. Too much government, control. yeah, too much government. So when you give, when you open the door, you cannot know how long, how far they will go to to your house. So, so, <laughs> it, it's really difficult. But when you open the door, they can do anything. You're <laughs> absolutely step right. Step, step by step. You're absolutely right. But I mean. Right, we're a small group within this room, right? We, we, we want an answer. We want, we somehow feel like we need our government to, to do something. We're not quite sure what we want to do yet, <laughs> right? We want free speech protected, but we don't want them stepping on rights. We don't want them stepping on free speech rights. But we want to be protected from hatred. Hate, and we're, equi we're equating hatred with harm. Okay, yes? You had a couple of slides back that you didn't really talk about where students who protest at the unpopular speakers actually bring more attention to the people. So to the speaker. Is, is the best way to, for people who are struggling with this, is the best way to ignore it? Well, I will tell you that we, um, last semester we had a former neo-Nazi come to campus to speak. Former. Okay. And he suggested 
that the best way to deal with these kinds of situations is to plan alternative events that happen at the exact same time, right? In another part, <coughs> exactly, yes. I don't think that's a bad idea, right? Everybody's speech then gets to be held and to be heard. Um, but I think it goes back to your point that there are going to be people who are going to hear, that are going to go and hear the hate speech, right? And there might even be some people who just want to go see the train wreck, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I think the Southern Poverty Law Center actually released a handbook on how to deal with um, controversial speakers on the, on the college campuses. And I don't remember all of the things that they put out there, but one of the things was that alternative mm -hmm. scheduling of an event at the same time. And then they had some other things that um, sort of honored the free speech, but also. Right allowed for protests or for counter um, action. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that shouting them down and like blowing the whistle, that's probably not one of them. No. Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, eggs and pies, no eggs and pies. <laughs> Right. It's just kind of incites right. And it solidifies the speaker's point that, you know, I have something so important to tell you and they don't want you to hear it. Right? Well, there are advocates out there who do want to do away with the First Amendment because the names before they're not unknown. But once you start down that slippery slope of limiting speech on the campus or some other venue, uh, the next time it's probably going to live in a little bit more mm -hmm. and creep pretty soon. Absolutely. They've achieved their goal of shutting down the First Amendment or that portion of it. Absolutely. Be on the, be on the lookout for that. Yes? Alternative, uh, I mean, alternative uh, arena is uh, practical. I think maybe you cannot get the two events at the same time, two alternative events at the same time. And also some people just, they want to hear, um, even they don't like that, but they may think, I, I want to hear, and I want to debate. Sure. Uh, so I don't think that alternative event is uh, practical. <laughs> that's, one of the, that's one of the primary ways in which, the, you know, the idea of combating this kind of hate speech is to provide alternative speech. You had a question. Yeah, uh, on your hate speech description here, one of the lines is it carries no meaning other than the expression of paper. Who gets to make, like on a college campus, who makes that determination? What, that it's an expression of hatred? Right. It's a question of, it's a, it's a balancing act. It's a question of, does the speech advocate Taking away the rights of others. Does that make Does that make sense? Yeah, that's the description of hatred. I mean, that's a. It's a very broad. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah it is. Well, like the Charles Murray thing. As small as his data was, he approached it as an academic. Right. Thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you'll take a if you take a look at the back of the handout, right, um, it talks a little bit about two different perspectives on free speech and hate speech, right? And the libertarian perspective, right? The government has to have a really good reason, a really good reason, right, to, to prohibit free speech. Um, and it talks about fighting words, right? Saying something that is going to evoke such outrage in a person that there's going to be some kind of lashing out as an example of a reason to prohibit free speech. Um, but it's a very, very narrow interpretation in terms of what should be restricted. Um, the other approach 
is about that that question of we need to make make our society a safe place for everyone, and that if one individual's free speech rights are squashing the rights of another individual, we have to look at that and figure out how to fairly adjudicate that, right? And that the dignity of humans is much more important than maybe the free speech of individuals. So there might be some free speech restrictions that are necessary to maintain the human dignity of, of our society. Yeah. or um, used fighting words, and I start the violence, knowing that they'll somehow get saddled with that, it just seems like it would be very easily manipulated and abused. Could be. It could be. It absolutely could be. I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, we're all individuals. Fighting words, I don't, maybe there's some words that would inspire people to lash out. Right? I'm sure we could all think of some. Um, whereas if, there, if those same words are said in different contexts by different people, we don't get nearly as upset. It varies. It's so, yeah, yeah. It makes me think of some videos I've seen. You mentioned Richard Spencer, so popped into my mind. I saw multiple videos of people maybe in the street that he was protesting in the street coming right up to him and like screaming and calling him all sorts of names and you're a horrible human being and you know all that right. swear words. Now, is that if he just if he decides not to punch them, I don't know if we decide that those are fighting words. What if he just decided to clock them and knocks them out? Were those now fighting words? He isn't the one who gets to decide whether it qualifies as fighting words, right? The court decides. Yeah. In, in your opinion. You're here. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I think he would have a hard time based on his speech. Do you, do you, do you know what I mean? Like, there was, a, there, was a, there was a scene with Richard Spencer where he was being interviewed on a street, and I, I want to say it was in Charlottesville, I'm not entirely sure, where he was being interviewed, standing up, and he got, some guy came up and just sucker punched him. Yeah, right? So the question is, did his speech inspire someone to commit the illegal act of punching him? And then does he have redress when he was the one who inspired the punching? <laughs> right, right. Right, and he punched them. Yeah. So you would go back to whatever you know you consider to be the original offensive speech. Exactly. And I think that's probably where the court would go to. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing that video over and over and over again because people were like, "Man, he has got blocked," <laughs> right? And pe and you know, but the thing about that is, right? Then it's turned around to be like, look, I was just speaking, which is my constitutional right to do, and these violent people came up and hit me. Yeah, right? So he wins that one. He wins that round, right? Because despite what he was, may have been saying, and the interesting thing about Richard Spencer is he's very, very, and normal. He really is. He's, I mean, you know, if you saw him walk in the library, just perfectly normal, nice guy, right? You wouldn't necessarily, he doesn't make a spectacle of himself. He doesn't come across as a lunatic, right? He's very effective, very, very. Yeah. Are there other countries who strike the balance differently than we do without going to the other extreme? 
Um, there are other countries, I don't know what you call the other extreme. I think there are other countries that are much, that are much more likely to crack down on the speech. As in closer to the free speech side or closer to the suppression of hate speech side? Closer to the free speech side you can get when we are babies and teenagers. But obviously, I mean, the extreme in this case is no free speech. Don't, you don't say anything out of line because you're going to be in trouble. Right. And here we have, as long as nobody actually dies, you can say whatever you want to. Is there, are there other countries that have found a middle ground? Um, our neighbors to the north are pretty, keeping in mind that, you know, nobody else has a First Amendment, right? right? Um, our neighbors to the north are pretty good at, um, maybe their middle ground is wider, if that makes sense. Germany might be a good example in that, right? So, like, Nazi symbols are not allowed, right? I mean, is that a f form of speech suppression? And, and that's where the press is, because yes, in, with early Hitler, they were absolutely Yeah. In terms of the general good, is that a bad thing? Right. In this very narrow instance. Right. It, it, it's, that, it's that second aspect, right? That, the, the community's well-being is the most important goal, right? And they've decided that the community doesn't need Nazi symbols. Mm -hmm. So is it somewhat anarchic and uh, it's cultural? I mean, this is something that's been in place my entire life. Mm -hmm. My entire life, I have felt that I have a right to say whatever I believe Right, right, right. Way, but that I have a right to my opinion and I have a right to state it. So if I grow up in a country that for whatever reason promotes that like idea, Germany, mm -hmm. that has a reason for maybe not allowing this, then I may look at this whole thing differently and then everyone around me who's lived there their entire life is going to look at it Speech police in Canada took him to court for hate speech, charged him with xenophobia or something like that. The last days of Europe? Well, America alone, I know that's one of the uh, books you know that I read. Okay. The memory is starting to fade at this stage of my life. And so, what did he write that mm. people took him the hate speech? Well, it's the invasion of the radical Muslims 
world is writing about the impact of their presence as opposed to Walter Lacker? No. Hmm. I can't I can't I'm sorry no. I can't put his name, but it's in there. I just can't read it out right now. So is it hate speech? Well, he, he, and, the, uh, he, he and his publisher, usually up, up there, the people cave because they don't have the finances behind them. But he and his publisher combined went to court with him. Mark Stein? Hmm? Mark Stein? Mark Stein. Okay. He, he's written three or four books on that same general subject. Mm -hmm. But his publisher combined, the two of them combined, took on the speech police in Canada at the, in the federal court. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we wouldn't want. <laughs> That's a case where the government was charging somebody that right. had with hate speech. We wouldn't want the government to come after, I mean, I wouldn't want the government going after Richard Spencer. I wouldn't. Right? I mean, he it. He's not harming anybody. He's not inciting any organization or any individual. He's just laying it out like he sees it. Spencer or the or this author? Mark Stein. Oh. I don't know. Do you, is it possible that his approach to the book or to the idea might incite people to harm the group that he's talking about? I don't think so. And it might not and it certainly isn't his intent. Right. So where are we? Where do we, where do we leave it, it right? It, the, Euro the European Union now, they have two extra items in their penal code that we don't have. One of them is xenophobia, I can't put it the other one. And you can be charged uh, with an uh, offense for those two, being one of those, if you're charged with one of those two, we don't have that in our penal code. In right. This country. Yeah. Now that's, is that shutting down free speech again? Sounds like it. Sounds like it. It's not here, but it is a government. Right. Right. I mean, look, the bottom line is we've got to figure out a way that allows for individuals to have speech free speech rights. We don't want our government to be too restrictive on, on free speech, right? That is at the crux of the First Amendment. We don't want our government to be too restrictive on, on free speech. We do want them to be protective of our people. Right? So speech that will promote or incite others to commit crimes against other members of our society, we want the government to be able to, in some ways, not censor, but maybe restrict. Right? Not a, not a ban, but a restriction on that kind of speech. Where does that free stop? It's true. That's the question. That's, that's kind of true, but we have restraining orders, right? We have, we have, there are mechanisms where the police, the, the justice system, can, can try to prevent things from happening, right? We have restrictions in other areas of our society. Maybe that's what we need here. Mm -hmm. It would be helpful if people in government modeled behavior that would <laughs> encourage <laughs> well, this is it's people <laughs> yes. to behave that way. I mean, ultimately, it's education, right. educating people, and behaving in a way that shows you respect other people. You can have a different opinion, and that's perfectly OK. But that doesn't give you the right to cut oh, down yeah. another, another human being. It's true. We've, we've lost. The art of conversation, the art of being able to disagree with someone but still have a conversation with them. And it's apparent in yeah. the government, and it's sad. Yes. Well, a big, big part of that falls right on the white right collector of the universities today. They're probably as good as anybody. Once you try those young, young kids' brains, it's hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Let's blame it on the media. Let's just blame it on the media. <laughs> 
Yeah. I have a question about the uh, many people hate political right and uh, what's the, I mean, uh, what do you think about political right and uh, speech, uh, freedom of speech? Political speech is out uh, of. Uh, no, no, I mean, like, uh, you can see this kind of thing or can see that kind of thing. There's a political right. Correct. Okay. Politically correct. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. You know, I mean, I think that's a fallback position in terms of don't say hateful things. Well, I have the right to say whatever I want, right? I think that goes back to respecting other humans, respecting other people. It, it, it's, I think we use that term political correctness. Um, Well, that's the, right. That's, that's the idea behind political correctness, right? That it, it is a restriction on free speech. But just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, but I, th I, don't, I think political correctness is a, it's a good thing, right? You don't need, let's remind you not say something too offensive to others. So well, you would think, but it's not, it's not viewed that way. I think from the 2013 campaign year, I think so many people hate <laughs> what is your crime. Yeah. No, I think it's, a, it's definitely a negative. It's viewed as a negative. So right. political correctness could be supportive of communalism. Yes. But it still is somewhat restrictive or offensive for those people who feel that they are constrained. Right. But the, if you are not a political correctness, you are not the not not charged or not respond not some legal responsibility for that, right? That well, people think, oh, they this fine. This guy is not polite. <laughs> well, I mean, right, right. It's, it, it, is it a question of being polite or being accepting of other people? I don't know. I mean, if you, if, again, because you have the right to say it, yeah. is it that important, is your right to say it that important that even though it hurts other people, you're still going to say it? Because I think that has more to do with you as a human being than it does with whether somebody's trying to suppress your free speech rights. I mean, you have the right to say it, but if it harms other people, why? <laughs> it just, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's something that's, that's not a legal perspective, that's not like, a, you know, <laughs> that's not a professor perspective, that's just like a human being perspective. Why is it necessary to, you know, call, to say things that harm other people, just because you can. Yes. Yeah, because I mean, you have the right to do it, and you're supposed to have a certain amount of thick, thick skin to be able to take it, but water off the duck's back kind of thing. But once it infringes upon your civil rights, then that's where you draw the line. And so it's, a, I mean, if it makes you mad. It makes you mad. You can't do anything about it. But once it crosses that line and infringes on your civil rights, then you can, you have a right to come back. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your remarks. I have a question of you because you're an educator. Essentially, the question is, how many generations are we, from your perspective or your opinion, away from that respectful? public square. Wow. And I raised that because of two observations. <clears throat> I live in uh, Franklin County, Fairfax, to be exact. And I'm in, within walking distance of the school. <clears throat> For the last school year, a number of the classes there have been studying things like the DVD uh, that focuses on Hitler rise of hate. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been looking at systems uh, 
oppression, different forms of government. And I have been just awed by the insight and the wisdom that these youngsters from the middle school to high school bring to discussion. Mm -hmm. Conversely, my wife is go-to manager in the senior citizens complex, 55 and over. <clears throat> Almost to a person, they represent some of the most clothed, oh, we're the only black people in the building too, that might be helpful. <clears throat> I, I said it might be helpful as I look at their lens and hear how they speak. They represent some of the most closed-minded people I have run into mm -hmm. as a southern boy born on a segregated farm in Tennessee, contrasted with Gold Vermont. And I'm wondering, is it a matter of youngsters like this, perhaps having some platform wherein they can engage cult adults, not their parents, mm -hmm. youngsters seem to be uh, freer, more liberated when they're talking to adults other than their parents. And I'm wondering if some kind of platform that brings about the dialogue between the two may help usher in that generation. How many generations do we have? How long do we How have? How long do we have to wait? <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that's a great question. I, I think that younger people have a very different view of the world, right? I think, in part, I think a big part of that is shaped, I, I'm a media professor, so I think a big part of that is shaped by media, right? In terms of students today have access to far more information than they've ever had access to before. Far more ideas, right, just, um, there's so much more for them to learn and to learn from, right, the rest of the world. Um, and I think that that greatly shapes um, our hope for the future, right, in that I think that if they have access to people who are, or at least ideas that are outside of maybe the ideas they have been taught grown up with, they at least have an opportunity to experience and see the world as a more connected place, um, as opposed to a us and them place, I think that moves us in the right direction. I'm not sure of how long that will take, right? But if you look at, if you look at how our society has changed in recent years, if you look at LGBTQ rights, right, and how quickly that, um, that issue has moved, um, has morphed. You know, if you think about our students' parents and their parents, it's light years from where it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? Um, so I think, I think you're right. I think there's hope for the future. I think that there is this notion of the world is getting smaller because we have the ability to be con more connected as a world community, and I think that that works in our favor. So it's moving us in the right direction. You're a media professor. I am. Do you ever talk about or study like the elimination of the fairness doctrine and um, the uh, ownership of media and major metropolitan areas by it used to be you could only want own one media outlet. Yes. And now one can you know, come in and buy up several media yes. outlets and they control yes. the thoughts, so, so, so to speak, for that area. I've always thought those two things have had a real polarizing effect. We do. we do. We talk a lot about conglomeration. We talk a lot about media ownership um, and about who controls the media, right? Because they what you have access to is what they tell you what to think. They tell you what to think about. They tell you, you know, yes, they shape you very drastically. Yeah.
Absolutely. Instead, now we have this wonderful creation called the cell phone that has apps. And the app, you click on it, and it says, oh, based on your recent click history, <laughs> these are the news articles that should be interesting to you. Yes. <laughs> the little alarm bells are going off in my head saying, I'm brainwashing myself <laughs> yes. every time I touch the screen. Absolutely. Yes, you know, um, we also look and spend a lot of time studying analytics in terms of how the current media system, right, uses and gathers information to tell you who you are yeah. <laughs> or who you should be. And those, those who control that ability to like move, it's like chess pieces, right? To move to where you need to be, right? They're gonna run the world. We've become commodities. Oh yes we have, yes indeed. That's a whole nother talk. I'll come back next time. <laughs> Sure. I wanted to thank you so much. It was a good experience. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>